This episode contains distressing themes and descriptions of sexual violence. This podcast is intended for a mature audience. Listener caution is advised. They Walk Among Us is part of the Acast Creator Network. Cinema owner Peter Moore had been arrested for the murder of Tony Davis at Penzon Beach in North Wales in December 1995. A detailed search of Moore's home indicated that the unassuming businessman had an interest in sadomasochism and other activities that were infinitely darker. After initially denying involvement in the murder, Moore made a late-night statement and said he wanted to confess to additional crimes he was not even suspected of committing. When he killed, he wore black, Nazi-style uniforms and claimed it helped him to dominate and terrify his victims. The 50-year-old cinema owner appeared before a judge today to face charges of murdering four men, which he denies. Mold Crown Court heard the attacks over three months last winter were frenzied, sadistic and vicious. Welcome to Season 8, Episode 2 of They Walk Among Us a podcast dedicated to UK true crime. Please listen to Season 8, Episode 1 for Part 1 of this two-part case. After requesting another interview in the early morning hours several days before Christmas in 1995, Peter Moore spent the next few hours confessing in vivid detail to a number of horrifying crimes. Moore told investigators he had been responsible for crimes as far back as the 1970s, including attacks on men in the Conwy Valley and Penzan Beach. He also said, I want to admit to both of the murders in Anglesey, the murder on Penzan Beach, And also, I want to admit to another murder that you don't know about, which I committed in the Kalganog Forest near Rithin. Peter Moore recalled witnessing an attack in New Brighton 20 years before he began assaulting people. Moore said, It was a truncheon attack on a gentleman in a lock-up cubicle. I observed but did not take part in it but he got a good battering. The truncheon was soaked in blood afterwards. When asked why he owned a truncheon, Moore replied, For the purpose of beating men up, I expect. Moore explained the first person he had attacked was a drunk farm worker in the early 70s. He had seen the man walking from the centre of Denby to a roundabout beside Brookside Mill and pulled over to offer him a lift. Moore then bludgeoned the man with a truncheon several times before dropping him off at the side of the road but denied sexually assaulting him. Moore said, I think it would be called a sexually motivated attack as I would take pleasure at the time and after I had gone away. Moore committed more assaults near a caravan park in Errol Hall and at a bypass picnic area at Hartford. Moore had gone to the public toilet and used a truncheon to attack someone he described as a fellow who was just looking for sex. Moore said he missed the man with the first swing of the truncheon, but partially stunned him with the second. Moore told detectives, He managed to get to his car, and I endured a hell of a chase through the best part of Cheshire. It was like something out of Starsky and Hutch, actually. We did U-turns at traffic lights and all kinds of things. Anyway, I got away with it. I don't think he was quite so prompt at going through red lights as I was. Moore went on to describe how films influenced his attacks, 
with the idea behind an assault on a lorry driver near Rithin coming from a Clint Eastwood movie. Moore said that he put a brick through the windscreen as the driver slept and waited for him to get out of the cab. Quote, he came out in absolute pitch black and I pulled his sleep suit or tracksuit down. He began to squeal and fight and I hit him with my truncheon and knocked him on the floor. When he started to fight back, I reached for my flick knife he screamed and I ran away. Moore was almost nostalgic as he recalled the same driver bringing a delivery to his shop a month later. He admitted, I was quite pleased. There was a satisfaction about all these, about being able to go and do it. Those attacks were of a different nature than the murder attacks. There was no feeling of sexual gratification from the murders. There was a totally different approach. Moore admitted to wearing leather clothes to appear more dominating and to intimidate his victims. He then spoke about what prompted him to change from assaulting men to killing them. Moore said that his mother had died in 1994 and soon after his two Alsatian dogs passed away. His favourite cat from the cinema was run over, and all of the koi in his fish pond died after it was struck by lightning. He explained he was then alone, and free to do what he wanted. Moore said, Death just seems to have followed me everywhere. I don't really know what was going through my mind but I've been under unbelievable pressure, financial, and the string of deaths that followed me. Mum and I were the best of friends. I did my best for her, but I missed her dreadfully. Moore had bought a knife from a hunting shop in Rill for £25 around the time of his 49th birthday and he intended to kill someone with it. Speaking about the murder of Henry Roberts in September 1995, Moore said that he had noticed the isolated cottage in Hegeliog Anglesey as he drove along the coastal road to Hollyhead on his way to work. One day Moore decided to stop at the house, and Henry came out into the yard and began shouting at the bizarrely dressed stranger that he was not Jewish. Moore explained that Roberts probably thought that he was a Nazi soldier because of the clothing he was wearing. Moore said, I knifed him several times with a knife I bought from Rill with the intention of killing someone. I stabbed him pretty well all over. I was alone. After Henry fell to the ground, Moore pulled down his victim's trousers and stabbed him in the buttocks before leaving. He told detectives that he had no regrets about what he had done. Moore then went on to detail killing a man the police had not known about. He said, The next one you haven't found yet. The young man I picked up in Paco's club in Liverpool. I drove him to North Wales, a forest between Rithin and Kerrigadridion. I murdered him. His body is in the woods there. Moore described how, when he was leaving Paco's in Liverpool, he was approached by a young man more described as a rather crude chap, very much worse for drink. Moore claimed the man propositioned him and asked him to come back to his house to have sex. The man got into Moore's vehicle, but instead of driving him home, Moore drove through the Mersey Tunnel and kept going through Mould and Rithin before going over the Denby Moors and into Cleganog Forest. Moore said that the man seemed scared and had tried to get out of the van twice before they arrived in the forest. 
The man asked Moore if he was a Nilsson-type fellow. A reference to Dennis Nilsson, a serial killer who killed at least a dozen men and teenage boys over a five-year period. Peter Moore said he gave a chilling one-word answer. Yes. He then started stabbing the man a total of four times. The victim crumpled to the ground and Moore calmly watched the man die. He then described the aftermath of the incident in more detail. Moore claimed he moved the body into the forest away from the road, but when he returned to get the man's keys, he was unable to find him. Moore said, Had I found him, I might well have mutilated the body further. Moore gave the detectives a map with the approximate location of the man's remains. It seemed once Peter Moore started confessing, he couldn't stop reeling off his other crimes. Speaking about the murder of Keith Randalls, Moore said that he had spotted the caravan when driving between cinemas. On the night Keith was killed, Moore walked up to the caravan and banged on the door three times before the door swung open. Before Keith had a chance to react or even ask a question to the stranger, he was stabbed in the doorway. A struggle ensued, and at one point Keith was able to throw the knife away from Moore. Moore said, He was slowing down. He was still fighting with me, but I got the knife again and killed him. As Keith lay bleeding on the gravel, he had begged for his life on behalf of his grandchildren. Moore told the detectives. He asked why I was doing it. I said one word. Fun. He just looked nonplussed and carried on screaming. There was a certain enjoyment from it. It was certainly not sexual, but it was a job well done. Moore said he left the scene and went home, but soon realised that his clip-on tie had come off in the struggle. He then drove back to Mona in Anglesey to retrieve it, and while he was there he stole Keith Randall's video recorder and turned his body over. Moore said, I just looked at him, and I could see that I had stabbed clean through him. It was quite horrendous, actually. You could see the steam coming out of him in the cold. It didn't upset me. I didn't cry or anything. I was pleased that I'd killed him. I'd done what I wanted to do. Everything I do, I do it properly. It was a job well done. After the admission... Peter Moore went on to describe the evening of December 17th, the night he murdered Tony Davis. Moore said he had driven around Plan Roost and Penman Mauer looking for a victim before arriving at Penzan Beach. He said that he saw Tony Davis standing at the water's edge and claimed that Tony had turned around and exposed himself. Moore said... I walked around and looked at him, then took the knife out and stabbed him. He was asked what led to him killing the man, and Moore responded, It's the feeling before when I'm going to kill someone. I've had this feeling on and off before, but I've never acted on it, and I've never had such an intense time. I just couldn't do it until there was impending trouble and I used to go and do it as a form of relief, shall we say. While it was in my mind that I was going to kill, all I could see was vivid yellow flashes in front of me like zigzags, all the way around, as if I wasn't in control of what I was doing. While I was travelling there, I wasn't in control. I can't explain. I haven't experienced it before, but I was practically blind. My vision went down to probably almost a circle. 
I know it comes up when I'm under extreme pressure. I don't know. I just don't feel the least bit sorry for anybody. When asked how he felt after killing his victims, Moore said, It was easy. Just like a knife through butter. Moore explained that he believed his staff were stealing from him in the cinema and he was being ripped off by millionaires, so he had to get back at society. He said that he was afraid the banks would repossess his house and he felt like everything was against him personally. Moore would admit that he had planned to allow himself to be caught after killing one more person. He said, I've been treated badly by the bank manager. I'd have made an appointment to see the manager and gone and killed him there and then and waited to be arrested. Then I'd have told the police what I've been up to. I think that would have been the end of it. Peter Moore's confession was alarming and the police immediately set off to the location he had marked on a map to look for the unnamed victim they had not yet found. Cluganog Forest spans over 50 square miles on the outskirts of Rithin. The expansive woods contain large conifer trees that were planted in the 1930s. On a cold evening in late December 1995, Investigators followed Moore's map to a secluded area in the forest and saw a remote track covered in light snow. Home office pathologist Dr. Waite would describe the lengths he had to go to to find the body. He later said, The scene was almost impenetrable and I had to use a saw to get to where the body was hidden. I saw my way through the trees. It was hard work, and we only had a small handsaw. On the forest floor, they found the severely decomposed body of a man wearing blue jeans crumpled around his ankles and black trainers on his feet. There were a set of keys on a cord around his neck, but his head and right arm were missing. The lower jaw was located a few feet from the body and the rest of the head was found a few yards away. Despite the level of putrefaction, the pathologist was able to determine that the victim had been stabbed four times in the abdomen and his body had been disturbed by predators in the area as it decomposed. With a fourth victim found exactly where Moore said they would be, the investigators then had to try and identify the man Moore claimed he met in Liverpool. It only took a few days for the police to connect Moore's account to a missing man from Birkenhead, 28-year-old Edward Carthy. Edward's mother died when he was a teenager so he spent his formative years living with his older sister Lynn and her family. As an adult, Edward, an openly gay man, began to struggle with drug and alcohol addiction according to news reports. Edward had been left heartbroken when his boyfriend took his own life in the months before he himself was killed. Describing how he would not have hurt a fly, a clergyman who worked at the night shelter where Edward stayed often said, He was a nice, gentle man. He was trying his best to overcome his problems. Edward Carthy was last seen leaving Paco's nightclub in Liverpool with an older man who was dressed in leather trousers and a leather jacket in October 1995. When he did not contact his sister for a few days, he was reported missing. Seven weeks passed before Lynn was told that her brother had been murdered. Edward's family and friends were devastated. However, unfortunately, the pursuit of justice was far from smooth, 
as Peter Moore called for another interview with detectives. And it was then he completely changed his story. Moore told the investigators that he had made everything up to cover for the real murderer, a man he claimed was a friend of his. He said that while he was present for the murders, someone else had killed the victims, and it was someone the police had not interviewed. Moore said, There's an awful lot more you haven't spoken to. The person in question was not known to some of my friends. I would like to say if you have not found out, we will leave it at that. I will never tell you who it is for personal reasons. Despite recanting his confession, Peter Moore was charged with all four murders by January 3rd, 1996. While the charges stunned most of those in North Wales, they were a welcome relief for Nigel Owens, who had been falsely accused of killing Henry Roberts and spent the end of 1995 behind bars until the murder charge was dropped. People who knew Peter Moore were shocked that he had been charged. A friend of the family, Fred Salt, told the North Wales Weekly News, Peter is the last person I would have thought to be involved with this sort of thing. He is so quiet and well-mannered. Moore had kept his dark side hidden well, most of the time. In November 1992, he punched a juvenile in the face with a clenched fist outside his cinema in Bagilt and was convicted of assault a month later. Then in September 1995, just a few weeks before Henry Roberts was killed, Moore was convicted of possessing an offensive weapon after an officer spotted a small wooden truncheon under the driver's seat during a traffic stop. Moore was fined £50, after claiming that he carried the weapon to protect himself as he drove around with large amounts of cash from the cinemas he owned. Moore pleaded not guilty to the four murder charges, and while he was remanded into custody, he was declared bankrupt, and his cinemas were closed. Before he was committed for trial, the police questioned Moore about several historical incidents that occurred in the Conwy Valley. Detective Inspector Alan Jones told the Weekly News, I can confirm that police have been investigating a series of attacks in the Conwy Valley as part of the investigations into Peter Moore. There were a number of attacks over a 10-year period starting in the later 1970s but not all of which were in the Conwy Valley. One attack occurred in September 1985, when a 52-year-old farmer was hit on the head with an iron bar as he walked along the A5. The man managed to walk two miles home and was found bleeding and suffering from a concussion the following morning. A month later, a similar attack was reported on a 64-year-old man at Conwy Morva. Then in March 1986, a man in Glen Conwy was knocked off of his bike and beaten. Two months later, another man was attacked outside Groys Inn after getting off a bus. He was bludgeoned on the head and fought with his attacker, who at one point pulled out a knife. The victim's head injuries were so bad that he required 50 stitches. At the time, the lead detective on the case said, This is a very ruthless and callous individual who could kill. As far as I'm concerned, the attack was attempted murder. We are looking into the possibility of a homosexual motive from words which were spoken by the attacker. In August 1986, Edward Barros, a holiday maker from Hull, was attacked with an iron bar at Gorse Hill and suffered a broken arm. 
Boros later said. I thought he would never stop hitting me. I thought I was going to be murdered. The final reported assault in the spree occurred in November 1986, and the victim was left with severe head injuries after being beaten with an iron bar. Further details emerged about Peter Moore's potential connection to the attacks when his murder trial began at Mold Crown Court on November 11th, 1996. The public gallery was packed when Peter Moore was brought up from the cells to face trial. Alex Carlyle QC began his opening address by telling the jury that Peter Moore was a respectable businessman by day, but by night he was someone completely different. Moore was one of the most dangerous people to ever set foot in Wales. The prosecuting barrister said that the defendant had admitted during his police interviews to committing over 17 attacks in a 20-year period before going on to murder four innocent men. Moore was described as being a violent and predatory sadist who dressed to intimidate and scare his victims. Despite his recantation, Moore had provided information about attacks going back to the mid-70s, and Alex Carlyle QC said, Some were reported, some were not, probably because of their homosexual context. The prosecutor believed that the death of Moore's mother may have triggered an extremely ugly change in the defendant's behaviour as he suddenly evolved from opportunistic attacks to murder. Speaking about Henry Roberts' death, Alex Carlyle QC said it was a bizarre coincidence that Moore and his victim had a shared interest in Nazi paraphernalia. Carlyle told the court, The body was riddled with stab wounds. There were 14 to his front and 13 to his back. He had been subjected to a frenzied attack and had obviously tried to defend himself against the savage onslaught that killed him. Henry's wallet was found in the bushes near Moore's home when it was searched, and a blood-stained swastika flag was found inside. Keith Randalls was described as an ordinary, harmless and conscientious man who was well regarded, and although shy, he had a good sense of humour. Alex Carlyle QC stated, Poor Mr Randall's misfortune was to be living on the defendant's route home. At an inquest earlier that year, Dr Waite had told the coroner that Keith Randalls had died from stab wounds to his lung and heart. He had sustained 12 stab wounds with a 7-inch blade, and injuries to his left hand. The mess inside the caravan indicated that Keith had fought bravely for his life. Keith's video recorder was found beneath Moore's sofa during the search of Darlington House. His watch was in Moore's van, and his mobile phone was found in the fish pond on Moore's property. Tony Davis's keys were also recovered from the fish pond and his blood was found on Moore's sweater. After outlining the details of each of the murders, the prosecutor explained that the knife used in all of the attacks had not been washed between the killings. Alex Carlyle QC told the jury, I will not show you that knife. It is unhealthy to do so because it has on it the blood of a number of dead men. He bought it with the intention of using it to kill for no other reason than his own pleasure, his own gratification. During police interviews, Peter Moore had said, I don't understand it. I feel not the slightest regret for what I have done. 
but I feel at peace. The prosecutor told the jury that Moore had claimed to see yellow flashes when he killed his victims. However, Carlisle stated, There is no evidence at all of a psychiatric nature in this case. There is no question of insanity or diminished responsibility. The prosecutor highlighted that the defendant had admitted to stabbing a sleeping lorry driver in the leg and told the court, that was the kind of behaviour the defendant was to repeat, but with grimmer consequences. Fortunately, the police were able to arrest him before he attacked his fifth victim. It was to have been his own bank manager. Moore believed his business was in financial difficulties, and the bank manager at the Midland Bank in Abigail had not been entirely fair to him. He was to tell the police he thought that would be the end of the killings, because he would expect to be apprehended. The court heard how Moore had changed his story in his final interview with the police, and claimed that someone else was responsible, but the prosecution contended that Moore was simply trying to turn his fantasies into a reality. The prosecutor told the jury... This most dangerous of men killed coldly for fun, to relieve tension, to gratify his sadistic instincts. Gesturing to Moore who sat in the dock in a black shirt, Alex Carlyle QC said, Black was his uniform. He was the man in black, with black clothes, black thoughts, and the blackest deeds. as well as statements from the victim's loved ones. The court heard from survivors of Moore's earlier assaults. A witness referred to as Mr. B testified that he had been drinking at the ship pub in Penzan one night in September 1993 and waited to sober up at the caravan park at Penzan Beach before going home. Mr. B said he had been there for around 20 minutes before he saw headlights approaching, and a man he later identified as Peter Moore walked over to him. The witness told the court, The conversation seemed normal, but towards the end I felt there was something untoward. I did not feel happy, and that led me to tell him I preferred women because I thought he was trying to tap me up for sex. Moore walked back to his car momentarily, then returned wearing a police hat and carrying handcuffs. He told Mr. B he was under arrest. Mr. B was unconvinced, and after being cuffed, he asked to see proof that Moore was a police officer. Moore told him, I'll show you some identification and then hit him over the head with the truncheon. Mr. B managed to run to a nearby caravan for help. After being treated for his injuries at the hospital, he realised £200 had been stolen from his car. Another witness, Mr. J, told the jury that he had been approached by Moore in August 1995. Mr. J was a gay man and provided consent for Moore to kiss him, but then Moore became aggressive, and the victim recalled that the more he tried to edge away, the more forceful Moore seemed to get. Moore grabbed the man's genitals, and as Mr. J tried to grab stones on the ground beside him to defend himself, Moore swore at him and told him, Don't do that before hitting him on the chest and arm with a truncheon. Mr. J said he had been too afraid to report the incident at the time, because his family did not know he was gay. Testimony was then heard from a Mr. C, a lorry driver who was attacked in a lay-by near Cleganog Forest in September 1991. 
Mr. C had pulled over in the lay-by to sleep as he had reached his maximum driving hours for the day. After dozing off at around 7.30pm, he was awoken by a noise that made him think a bird had somehow got into the lorry. He went around to the back of the vehicle to investigate when he was suddenly struck by what he thought was an iron bar. The scar left by the injury was still evident as he testified. Mr. C said that he fought with his attacker, but as he kicked out, he was stabbed in the leg before the attacker fled the scene. Testimony in relation to Moore's initial confession was then introduced. Inspector Garrett Williams told the court that he had been summoned to Moore's cell at Landedno Police Station when Moore pressed the alarm bell. Moore had asked for writing materials and spent the next hour writing letters, including one to an associate asking him to take care of his pets, as he intended on making a full statement to the police. Tape recordings of Moore's interviews in which he confessed were then played for the jury before the defence began to argue their case. Peter Moore's barrister Eric Somerset Jones QC said that while his client admitted to carrying out over 50 attacks on men, Moore had not committed the murders he was charged with. Somerset Jones told the jury. The frankness of Mr. Moore's revelations of his connections with the assaults has solved crimes which would have remained unsolved. But the only evidence linking him to the killing arises out of his admission relating to Edward Carthy. Moore claimed that the person responsible was a man the defence said he met in the twilight world of sadomasochism in the summer of 1995. Moore said that he had stopped meeting men on Penzan Beach after the police began to crack down on what was going on. He had instead gone to Llandalas Beach, where he met a man named Alan Williams. Moore claimed that he nicknamed him Jason because Alan Williams was fascinated with knives and had a shared interest in sadomasochism. Moore's defence counsel said, To many, it's a completely strange world. To some, it's a world they may not believe existed. According to Peter Moore, Jason was new to the area and only knew people he worked with as a waiter at the Empire Hotel in Llandidno. Moore's physical description of Jason was 5 feet 10 inches tall, with short black hair that was greying at the sides. He was around 48 years old and had a slim and clean appearance. Moore expanded on his description. He said that Jason drove a white Datsun and lived on the promenade. They quickly developed a romantic relationship. Moore even gave Jason a key to his home, which he visited numerous times a week. The defendant claimed that he had bought a double-edged knife as a gift for Jason and also allowed Jason to borrow his leather jacket until he bought his own in December 1995. Eric Somerset Jones QC said, Mr Moore lent the jacket to Jason and he gave him the knife shortly before Henry Roberts was killed. They were in Jason's possession at the time of the four murders. After describing the relationship between Moore and the man he supposedly confessed to protect, Jones stated, This is an opportunity to assess whether Peter Moore is a hard, sadistic killer or a soft man who builds a hard shell around himself. He is a weakling starved of heterosexual love who derives satisfaction from humiliating men. He was enmeshed with a killer and after hours of interviews, 
began to unburden himself. Peter Moore then took the stand in his own defence. He admitted to assaulting, degrading and humiliating men over a 20-year period, but denied killing anyone or intending to cause serious harm during the assaults. When asked about the attack on Mr. B at Penzan Beach, Moore said, We were inside the public conveniences when he opened his trousers and exposed the fact he was wearing women's underwear. Moore claimed they then sat in his car and Mr. B noticed a police hat. Moore continued, I told him I was a policeman and secured him in handcuffs. He asked for identification. I got my wooden truncheon out and threatened him with it. He pleaded with me to let him go, and he ran away. Moore admitted to attacking Mr. J and another witness, Mr. E, with his truncheon. The only thing he found inaccurate about Mr. C's account of being assaulted near his lorry was that Moore had used a gun to bludgeon him, not a metal bar. Moore acknowledged that he obtained sexual pleasure for weeks after the assaults. He said he liked to tell others about his actions as he had strong sexual memories based on violent humiliation imposed on others. Asked about the blood-stained leather jacket that was found during a search of his home, Moore claimed that he had only loaned the jacket to Jason, which Jason had for some time and Moore only got it back in mid-December. He maintained that his confession was false, and his description of the murders was accurate because they were Jason's words, not his. It was Jason who had told him everything. Moore professed that he and Jason met Henry Roberts at a petrol station, and something about Henry's appearance told Moore that, quote, he was either homosexual or lonely, probably both. Moore said that Jason told him he wanted to attend to the gentleman, which Moore took to mean that Jason wanted to, quote, sexually hurt or assault the gentleman in the style that I have admitted to doing to other men. According to the defendant, they went to Henry's home, and while Moore waited across the road in the car, Henry began shouting that he wasn't Jewish. Moore said, He seemed to be panicking, and said it several times. I knew that Jason had the knife on him. Moore claimed that he heard Jason tell Henry that Henry was going to die and he had listened to the details of how Henry was killed when Jason got back into the car. Earlier in the trial, a witness who worked at Paco's Bar in Liverpool testified that he had seen Edward Carthy leaving with an older man who was dressed in black leather. Daniel Hahn told the court that he witnessed Edward talking to Peter Moore about his recently deceased partner, Warwick. The witness said, They were definitely together. I could tell by their posture and the way they sat. On the stand, Moore claimed that Jason had been with him at the bar, and Jason had been the one to kill Edward Carthy and had hummed Teddy Bear's picnic as they drove to where the body was hidden. Moore said, It was a very brutal murder, and I know every detail of it. I was shocked by it. I argued extensively about it with Jason. Speaking about Keith Randall's death, Moore claimed he and Jason had been driving to Hollyhead Cinema together on November 29, 1995, when Jason spotted the caravan at the roadworks. Moore said, 
He wanted to stop there on the way back because he thought there was a good chance there may be a man in there. I told him I wasn't prepared to do it, and he said he would come back in his own car if I didn't. Peter Moore told the court after being threatened with the knife. He stopped by the junction and Jason got out of the van. He described the windows were open in the vehicle and he could hear three distant bangs. Moore said, Almost immediately there was shouting. It was almost like a fight going on. Then there was a high-pitched, terrified scream which went on for some time. Dr Alistair McPhee, who had carried out investigations at Keith Randall's murder scene, said that there was evidence that Keith had answered a knock on the door as he got ready for bed. Dr McPhee testified, It is likely he received an injury at some stage and moved a short distance before he was finally turned over onto his back. Moore claimed that as he drove back to Darlington House with Jason, Jason told him how Keith had died after begging for his life. They later returned to the scene as it was in fact Jason who had lost his clip-on tie in the attack, according to Moore. As he gave evidence, Peter Moore made a surprising statement implying that Keith Randalls was a drug dealer. Referring to Moore's earlier admission to urinating on someone after assaulting them, the prosecutor said, You are doing in the witness box the verbal equivalent of urinating over Mr. Randalls. Describing his account of Tony Davis's death in December 1995, Moore claimed that he had watched Jason follow Tony to the water's edge. Moore told the court, we knew he was a gay man looking for sex. My thoughts went to murder, and I wondered if Jason had got the knife with him. My thoughts were with the man. I thought he might be in danger. I shouted to tell him to keep away from Jason. I said he's dangerous. In tears as he testified... Moore claimed that Jason came towards him with the knife and knocked him backwards, causing him to hit his head before Jason went over to Tony Davis and stabbed him. According to Moore, he got up and comforted Tony as he died. Moore told the court, I kneeled down and held the man's hand. He said he loved his wife and that he had got two children. He gave me a sigh and died in my arms on the beach. Peter Moore was asked when he had last seen Jason, the man who had allegedly committed the murders. Moore said he had only seen him once since Tony Davis's murder. He was seated in the public gallery when Moore was brought to Colwyn Bay Court and charged. Moore said that he still loved Jason. During cross-examination by Alex Carlyle QC, the defendant was asked if he was enjoying the publicity. Moore, who had been photographed smirking as he entered the court each day, replied, To a degree. Carlyle said, That is why we are here. That is why you are pleading not guilty so that you can enjoy reliving the horrendous humiliation you imposed on others. Referring to the number of items belonging to the victims found in Moore's home, the prosecutor accused Moore of being a sexual fantasist who collected trophies. The prosecutor said that the defendant's outfits were part of his fantasy. Quote, Full leather was the uniform of power. Power dressing for perverts. He devised a play that was for real. The other person was the co-star. 
Moore had only mentioned someone else being involved during the last 25 minutes of the final interview and had initially refused to name Jason because he claimed he wanted to protect him. Moore had not revealed Jason's identity during the 25 interview tapes that were played at the trial, but explained, I intended to take responsibility myself because everything was messed up. My business was lost. The cinemas were lost. And I was lost. When asked why he had been prepared to throw his life away for murders he claimed he did not commit, the defendant said, I have seen some dreadful things. I hope none of you ever see what I have seen. Some horrific things I will never forget. My life is ruined. Moore was also asked why he did not contact the police after Jason killed Henry Roberts, and he replied, I was very ill at the time. I had seen a man murdered. I certainly felt blame when I did tell them, but I felt better that it was at last out in the open. The prosecutor responded, you used your extraordinary imagination to come up with the story about Jason a month after the initial interviews were concluded. It was a carefully prepared high drama, part of your filmic imagination. The prosecution argued that Moore had based Jason on the main character from the horror franchise Friday the 13th. Moore had admitted to seeing one of the films in the 1970s, and the prosecution reminded the jury that was when the attacks began. Describing the Friday the 13th films, Alex Carlyle QC addressed the defendant. They are about a man dressed in black who kills with a black-handled knife. A knife like yours. Is this the Jason of the films, a hero of yours? Is he the Jason or your imagination of how you would like to be? Even more aggressive, cruel, but a bit fitter and a bit more athletic. The prosecutor accused Moore of turning a fantasy from his fascination with cinema into real-life horror, suggesting he had turned the events into a tragic reality for other people. Moore denied creating Jason, or any of the allegations that he was based on the character from the Friday the 13th films. When asked why he smiled in response to a question about it, Moore said it was because he found it absurd. A prosecutor argued that it may be absurd to rational people, but to a homicidal maniac it would be a normal thought. Referring to Moore's claims about Jason's occupation, the prosecutor joked that he was a very lucky waiter if he was given Saturday nights off to go and kill people. Director of the Empire Hotel, Elise Waddy, wrote a statement read to the court that noted she had no knowledge of an Alan Williams or anyone by the name of Jason on their payroll between April 1995 and April 1996. The prosecution had been unable to prove that Jason existed outside of Moore's imagination. Forensic evidence presented to the court showed that a mixture of the different victims' blood had been found on the knife and Moore's leather jacket. Moore's blood was also found on the pebbles next to Tony Davis's body on Penzan Beach, and Tony's coat was found in Moore's house. A forensic expert testified that one possible scenario was that Moore had stabbed Keith Randalls and Henry Roberts while wearing the jacket and had cut himself while attacking Tony Davis on the beach. The expert witness also said that although there was a remote possibility the allegations against Moore were untrue, 
it would be challenging to explain another set of findings. The Defence Counsel countered this by saying, The findings could be explained if some person other than Moore had been wearing the jacket at the time of the stabbing. During the time of the attack on Tony Davis, Moore could have cut himself and was shedding blood on Penzant Beach. Equally, Mr Davis's duffel coat could have been taken from him at the beach and found in Peter Moore's home. Testimony followed from forensic psychiatrist Dr David Finnegan, who told the court that Peter Moore sought publicity and enjoyed terrorising his victims, but was not insane. Dr Finnegan had interviewed Moore in prison and learned that Moore had a habit of going around under the cover of darkness and threatening mostly drunk or vulnerable men before degrading and assaulting them. Speaking about the sexual gratification Moore got from the attacks, Dr Finnegan testified, The induction of fear and terror and consequent feeling of power was, I feel, his main motivation. The attacks were always caused by pressure of some kind, even minor pressure. In his closing statement, the prosecutor Alex Carlyle QC highlighted that Peter Moore had not washed the knife between the murders. He just placed it back into his tool kit in his vehicle, ready for use again. Carlyle said, by the time he was admitting these offences to the police, murder had become his craft, in succession to his former hobby of bludgeoning men whom he waylaid in the countryside. I submit the evidence is overwhelming, that this defendant committed all the murders. Carlyle believed it was inconceivable that the detailed confession Moore provided was the description of another man's actions, as two of the murders were very similar to two of the non-fatal attacks Moore had confessed to. Carlyle argued that Jason was a figment of Moore's imagination and that his name came from Moore's obsession with films. In reference to Keith Randall's, who the prosecutor said had surmounted the odds by knuckling down and getting a job and maintaining close contact with his family after the breakdown of his marriage. Alex Carlyle QC stated, We may well think the second visit by Moore and his allegations based on no evidence whatsoever that Mr Randalls was a drug dealer was his final attempt to humiliate his victim. Mr. Randalls put up a spirited struggle, and the subsequent forensic evidence revealed traces of his blood on Moore's jacket and knife. Mr. Randalls lay there being killed and pleading for his life for his grandchildren, being able to see them again, and it is maybe at this point we detected a moment of conscience in Moore. And during police interviews, he hesitated before admitting he told Mr. Randalls he was killing him for fun. Reminding the jury that he had described Moore as the man in black, with the blackest thoughts who committed the blackest deeds, Carlyle said, We submit that the evidence in this trial has brought out the reality of that. At the end of the third week of the trial, Peter Moore's counsel presented his closing statement. The majority of Eric Somerset Jones' QC speech involved Moore's intention to be convincing during his police interviews because he was covering for a friend who he still loved. The barrister told the jury that Moore did not shy away from testifying and that the scientific evidence was still consistent with Moore's claims that Jason was the murderer. He reminded the jurors of cases where women had protected their partners, and argued if it could be seen in heterosexual relationships, it also existed in gay relationships. Eric Somerset Jones QC said, 
I have no brief for Peter Moore's way of life. On his own admission, he is a bad man. I am not here to excuse his behaviour or the way he has conducted his personal life. Neither is he on trial for that behaviour, no matter how unsavoury it may appear to many of us. But it is the duty and obligation of a barrister to defend or prosecute irrespective of any prejudices. No matter how bizarre the offences are, however likely it may seem a man is guilty, he may also not be guilty. A jury of eight men and four women were sent out to deliberate and returned just over two and a half hours later. Peter Moore sat impassively and nodded with a slight smirk as the verdicts were read aloud. Moore was found guilty of all four murders. Peter Moore, the killer who claimed he did it for fun and said it helped relieve stress. In sentencing Moore, the judge, Mr Justice Kay, told him, I consider you to be as dangerous a man as it's possible to find. It was killing for killing's sake. After the trial, the family of one victim spoke about the verdict. We as a family are now going to try and come to terms with our father's death, which until today we've not been able to do. We feel nothing but disgust for this lowest of life form, and as long as we live, we will never begin to forgive such an evil person. The judge will now recommend that more never be released. Peter! 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 As Peter Moore was led from the court, shouts echoed from the public gallery calling him scum and telling Moore that they hoped he would rot in hell. Following the sentencing, Moore gave a statement to his solicitor Dylan Reese jones which read, It is with regret and disappointment that I face my conviction for four murders today. I will continue to assert my innocence to these charges, and it is my intention to seek advice as to the possibility of lodging an appeal against my conviction as soon as possible. I knew from the start that nobody could win in this matter. Not the deceased, the relatives, not myself, nobody. Keith Randall's daughter Lisa spoke after the conviction and described how she could never forgive Peter more. If he'd shown even a little remorse, it would have been easier, she said but you could tell from listening to the interview tape that he was relishing it. He killed my dad so matter-of-factly, as calmly as someone reading a book or doing a crossword. Even after hearing all of the evidence, those who knew Peter Moore as their quiet neighbour and business owner who ran cinema clubs for children on Saturdays, struggled to reconcile the image they had of him with the man in black described in court. One neighbour said, He was a lovely man, the perfect gentleman. I trusted him so much I would have let my grandchildren walk along the beach with him. I still can't believe he was capable of such horrible things. Another neighbour told the weekly news, Everyone in the area knew Peter was gay, but nobody ever guessed his past could be so sordid. I just can't believe it. I am absolutely shell-shocked. It's not every day you find out you have a murderer on your doorstep. Others who knew more were not a surprise to learn about his dark side. Lewis Colwell, who co-owned the Futura Cinema in Denby with Moore, said, There was always a violent streak there, although he never used it on me. The world will be a safer place with him locked up. He wasn't at all liked and was very much a lone wolf. He had a lot of trouble when he ran the cinema in Bagilst, 
but he could take care of himself. He threw out some drunks one night single-handed. Lead investigator Detective Superintendent Peter Ackerley believed that the words evil, vile and depraved were not adequate to describe Peter Moore. He said, There must be a likelihood that he would have continued, notwithstanding what he said himself, that he was going to kill one more and then let the story unfold. So where are we now? Following Peter Moore's conviction, activists spoke out about the prejudice against gay men, which had led them to meeting in seclusion, which in turn put them at risk. One anonymous man told the Weekly News, There are just no facilities around here for gays to meet, so we go cruising in secluded areas. That's always going to give opportunities for killers and blackmailers. The whole gay scene here is driven underground because of all the homophobia. There's just nowhere for us to go. So men go cruising in dark secluded spots like Penzan Beach where anything could happen. Peter Moore attempted to appeal against his whole life tariff alongside other notorious convicted killers at the European Court of Human Rights in 2009. The appeal was dismissed in 2012, as the High Court found that a whole life tariff was required in cases that involved sexual or sadistic conduct, and there were no mitigating features. Peter Moore remains behind bars in Wakefield Prison and will remain incarcerated for the rest of his life. Thank you for listening, and special thanks to our patrons for supporting the podcast. For more information on this episode, please see the show notes or visit our website, theywalkamonguspodcast.com.